until I get them off. This so, guy from your book there. I mean, those were his orders too. You know, his superiors told him to do that. Yes. I got from your book there was no reason to go. There. I'm sorry. I, I got from your book that there was no reason to go there. They didn't have to. No. They, but uh, Halsey wanted to redeem his reputation as far as the air group was concerned. And so they, he kept ordering them out. Nimitz kept ordering them out. They didn't really have to, but they thought if we keep the pressure on the Japanese, they'll come to the peace table sooner. And if we don't, the pressure on them. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a thinking. But more and more, these aviators like Billy Hobbs and Eugene Mandeberg are starting to think, man, it's not fun. I don't want to go out anymore. Hennessy was a gifted flyer. And he's talking about ceasing to exist this day. He wrote that. This isn't something he told me in one of my interviews with him. He wrote a series of like stories at the time, and it came from one of those stories. Now they're getting angst antsy a little bit, but not Halsey. Third, third Fleet's job is to hit the Empire hard and off. This superb fighting outfit is doing just that. And my only regret is that the ships do not have wheels so as to chase them in them after we drive them from the coast. We want to keep the good heat on the end. Always, always, always. Plus, redeem his reputation a little bit. Do the Japanese have any aircraft at that time? Surviving? Aircraft, yeah. You want to yeah oh yeah, they're, they're always flying against opposition, but the aviators in those aircraft were very unskilled. The Japanese, the big mistake they made was they didn't set up an adequate training system to replace flyers who had been killed. And so if a skilled aviator was shot down and killed, they had nothing ready to go right away. Whereas in the United States, they were constantly training these air groups, squad, all the time. And shift them around after five, six months. We had skilled pilots, aviators, all the time, and the Japanese did not at this time. Now, in early August, first week of August, Halsey pulled away from the coast of Japan. None of the guys could figure out why. That's not like him. Well, on July 22nd, Halsey had been informed, secretly, obviously, of the atom bomb and given orders to pull back when we tell you to. Don't get away from Japan, the coast of Japan. So they pulled away. Well, on August 6th, the first atom bomb obviously Hiroshima. August 7th, the next day is when the air group learns of this, Billy Hobbs and all. Ralph Moreland was another pilot in that um, air group. All hands very much thrilled. It will shorten the war tremendously. Man, we're getting close to the end of the war. We don't have to go against Curie or any of the other, these other targets. Then August 9th, the second atom bomb, they're starting to sink. <laughs> uh, they're thinking maybe we can get back home to families. August 7th, Hobbs in his diary, maybe there will be a lot of lives saved. And maybe I'll be home. So his first entry was, I'm anxious to get into the action. Now it's maybe we'll get home soon. Sonia even started planning the wedding for she and Eugene. We were going to talk about the way, of course, it's kind of hard to make definite plans, but just doing it, you know, really pumped them up, obviously. Well, men did not want to take off in any further missions, but they received orders to keep it up. The very next morning, the war was on again, wrote Lieutenant Commander Huddleston. He was in charge of one of the units. And the pilots, the aviators, kept thinking, why are they sending us back out? Because the longer they would be fighting a war that had already been won. Why do we have to keep fighting a war that was already won? The atom bomb took care of that. Why are we doing this? But again, Halsey wanted to repair his reputation, and the gov US government wanted to make sure the Japanese would not back out, and they wanted to nudge it to the peace, the peace table. If I ever prayed in my life, I'm praying tonight that this will end this bloody war, 
Chaplain Moody just came by and said, no dice, so I guess we will strike. This is the day before August 15th. So I guess we are going out on August 15th, Maurice Crocker Road. Now, that last flight, August 15th. Billy's team was not even scheduled to go out that day. It wasn't their turn. But his commander said, Billy, you need one more to earn a promotion. So I'm going to go talk to the other team leader and see if we can trade places. Billy didn't want to. We shouldn't need to strike again, he wrote in his diary. But Cagle says, I need one more to make it ten. So they switched. And he went up on this final strike. Now, they didn't obviously know it would be the final strike. But that's what it turned out to be. At 4.15 in the morning, Harrison was a team leader and 11 other Hellcats lifted off. He detached two of the pilots because of the thick cloud cover to remain at high altitude and relay messages to and from the carrier Yorktown about the progress of their mission. So now Harrison has 10 aviators in his group. Two are left to relay messages. One team of four Hellcats, led by Odom, became lost, and in the action report describes it like this, a finger of overcast. Now to me, that doesn't sound like a very thick overcast, does it? A finger, it became lost, but anyway, that's what it read. Now they're out of the action, so they're down to six aviators, including Billy Hobbs and Eugene Mandarin. <clears throat> Well, they're nearing their target, near Tokyo, when at 6.30 a.m. Yorktown received the message, stop operations. War's over. Stop. So they relayed the news. Harrison and his six aircraft, aircrafts, are then over their target at Sugi Airfield, near Tokyo. They're told to abort their mission. They start to turn around five miles out. They're attacked by 15 to 20 Japanese fighter aircraft and shot down. Salos plane is hit and he bails out near or over Tokyo Bay. Crocker and Hansen survive. Heavily damaged aircraft, but they do survive. Now there are three left, Harrison, Hobbs, and Mandarin. As Hansen and Crocker are leaving, they saw one of those three aircraft explode with the aviator parachuting out, and they saw the other two smash into the ground. But they couldn't tell which was which. Is this Hobbs who bailed out, Mandeberg, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think of it in the cockpit of Billy's plane, he's been told the war is over. He's ecstatic. Instead, he dies. He still has his mom's ring hanging on the chain, his dog tail chain knowing the war ended and I'm getting shot down. Two Japanese farmers observed this action and saw these planes crash. One crashed a quarter mile away from their farm. <clears throat> they ran toward that site and saw the, re the results. <clears throat> uh, they ran toward the site and saw the results, a large hole at the lower slope of the hill, smoke pouring from there, and the plane just scattered them all over. The Japanese military officials then were called in, and they with civilian fire and wrapped the remains of this one pilot in a straw mat and carried them to a Buddhist shrine for burial. Now, since Salaf had turned toward the sea, the one body buried there had to be either Hobbs, Harrison, or Randall. The Salaf had turned toward Tokyo Bay but no one knew who it was. Now this is a copy of one page in the action report, the official action report that you get in the archives. <clears throat> I didn't smuggle that out, by the way. <laughs> you can get all this online, and World War II records are not classified, obviously. And this is all available online. But I just thought, it, when I read this and saw that, which is repeated here, it just slapped me in the face. To see it in a 
right on paper in ink. These guys failed to return with this flight, shot down over the target. I don't know, it just made me stop for a while in my research and think a little bit about it. Chaplain Moody, the Yorktown chaplain, said Harrison, Salop, Haas, and Mandenberg were lost on what I always considered a stupid mission. This is a Catholic chaplain on the day the treaty was signed. Personally, I blame Halsey for sending out this strike when he knew the war would be over momentarily. <clears throat> now the aftermath in Kokomo, there's I accessed all the Kokomo Tribune papers to find out what the Hobbs family would be reading. They're ecstatic, obviously. The whole town went, erupted into wild celebration. It was written right there. And this is part of it, what they did, honking horns, yelling, just having a great time because the war is over. Mr. and Mrs. Hobbs? Yeah. They were happy, but they didn't know yet for sure. Billy, okay. They didn't know. Billy was still over there in the Pacific. The town was celebrating. His parents couldn't be part of it. That was by a member of the family. She told me that. They just couldn't. Same thing with the Mandebergs and Sonia Levine. They couldn't celebrate. Sonia, my aunt, her daughter told me, Mom was planning a life with Jean. The war had just ended. And all of New York was celebrating, but she couldn't. They just didn't know yet. So, you know, they thought it was okay. But they hadn't heard from their sons in a while. August 26, that's 11 days after the end of the war, Zelda, that's the mom of Mandeberg, informed Sonia Levine, the girl he would marry. So, well, from Eugene. I do hope to hear from him soon. This waiting is getting me down. 11 days after, still haven't heard. The war is over, people celebrating, but is Eugene okay? Finally, August 29th, two weeks after he had been killed, she got a pack of five letters from Eugene. The last one written August 14th, the day before he was killed. So she's thinking August 14th, the war ends August 15th, what are the odds of something happening to him? He's probably okay. Probably. Then Joyce Hobbs, Billy's sister, mailed a birthday card to Billy. Remember, that was his birthday when he was shot down. She gets it back. That's the actual envelope. Returned to sender unclaimed. And they're going, what's this? Why, why did they send this back? She sent a second one, same thing. Return to center. I'm sure they couldn't have felt too good. And then finally, a letter that was written on August 16th, but they did not receive it until later, came from Cable, you know, the guy who sent them out on that final mission, stating, it's my duty to inform you your son is listed as missing in action. They don't declare them as killed in action until they know one way or another, or until a year plus one day has gone by. So they're labeled as missing, excuse me, in action. <clears throat> Cable continued, all we know is that there is hope that Mandy's playing. Now he sent one to each of the four. This is the one that went to the Mandibles. Mandy's plane only was damaged, and then he succeeded in landing Get more parachuting to save Mid September made it a little more efficient. There's one of the telegrams. This is to the Manbirds. There's the address from my family. From the government, deeper we get to inform you that he is missing in action. You uh, will be furnished details when we see. So they still can't do anything but wonder. That's the way that Pokemon Tribune put it, that he was shot down shortly after word came that the war had ended. That was in the Pokemon newspaper. 
finally, Cagle wrote an October letter. We all had great hopes that we would find them. We searched, they searched prison camps everywhere they could trying to locate these guys. No avail. I'm sorry to say, but I'm sure you want only the truth that we cannot hold no further hope for the life of your son. <clears throat> a year later, a year plus a day, Secretary of Navy Forrestal sent them this that reluctantly forced the conclusion that they are deceased. Detroit Free Press article on Eugene Mandeville. Something very simple, very sparse, but very powerful to the families involved for sure. I had to read it with that. Hattie Hops planned a memorial service that was well attended. Um, the newspaper covered it. He gave his life in combat for his country. It was the last, he was, and Howard was it, uh, calling Howard the last Howard Cunty used to give his life in combat for his country. But here's, here's the problem with uh, even memorial services, there's nothing to have there. No body, no remains, nothing. They buried mementos, but not the actual person. And so there was never any closure, not complete composure, uh, 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 closure, excuse me. Nancy Exmeyer, Billy's sister, said that for the rest of her life, her mom, Hattie, would sit on the front porch. Now, that doesn't mean every day, all day kind of thing, but you know, throughout the rest of her life, glancing down the road as if expecting to see Billy stroll up. She would sit and look down the lane. She was always looking to see if he might be coming. Yeah. Hattie Blaine calls him for Billy's death. Zelda did the same. Zelda hated Halsey made these boys go out when he knew the war was winding down. Now, they have to blame someone, right? They're in grief. Obviously, it's a stage that anyone will go through. You have to, it's not my fault kind of thing, so I've got to blame someone, obviously. <clears throat> and she also wondered if maybe he'd come strolling up one day and all would be well. Hattie, <clears throat> Dwight's mom, Billy Hodges, every year on the anniversary of his death, which was also his birthday, wrote a poem in the Pokemon newspaper printed it. And this was the first one. It's in memory of all of those who died. And she wrote that about Billy. His smiling way and pleasant face are a pleasure to recall. He had a kindly word for each and was beloved by all. The years may wipe out many things, but the bond of love won't sever the memory of those happy days when we were all together. She did that every year until her death, <clears throat> a different poem. Now what's going on today? In 1946, the American Graves Registration Team went back to the site of the flyer who, whose remains were found and buried near the temple. They visited the site of the plane also and confirmed, yeah, the plane was an F-6 Hellcat and it probably did come from Yorktown. Billy and Mandeberg flew an F-6 F Hellcat fighter. But in those days, no DNA, right? So they couldn't do anything about it. The remains were moved to the Philippines, lacking identification, all they could do was hope. Maybe it'll be my son that one day something will turn up and we can identify. Well, now the DNA uh, testing is in progress as we speak. They are testing the, re the, the DNA of that set of remains, so somebody will find it out. Is it Billy, is it Eugene, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now in March of this year, Richard Mandeberg, the nephew of Eugene, emailed me and he said, we've got some news, they think it might be Mandeberg, but they don't want to officially state that. They're doing more DNA testing to be conclusive. The Hobbs family has also given DNA samples, etc., uh, to see. And, and that's the last word I've received from them. But they are working on it. <clears throat> the two people from that time are still alive. 
I mentioned them both here, Nancy Hobbs, the little sister of Billy, and Sonia Levine, as of a few months ago, and he was still alive in New York City, um, as I contacted them to see how she's doing. She was a great interview, by the way, uh, talking about um, the love of her early life. Now, she wanted to have a very happy life with another man she married eventually, and a wonderful family in New York City. Her daughter, Susan, wanted to compile a documentary about Sonia's experiences for the family. Nothing that, you know, go on Netflix kind of thing, but just for the family. And Susan did that because she said, I always knew about Mandy. Mom talked about him. There, there was always this other part to our family. In doing the research for that, she contacted the, the Mandibergs, Richard and Jean Mandiberg, the niece and nephew of, of, of Eugene, who knew only that their uncle had been engaged to a woman named Sonia. They didn't even know too much about her. So they started you know, sharing stories, trading different things that they had learned. Um, Susan said her mom was visibly relieved to hear that Eugene might not have died a watery death in Tokyo Bay, but on land, respected by a Buddhist monk. You know, it just gave her a sense of comfort that maybe he was taken care of. And maybe we'll get identification sooner or later. <clears throat> the memory of the air group and ships is kept alive. The Patriots Point Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, has the Yorktown. That was a ship Billy threw off of. Is right there. There's three members of the Hobbs family. Talk to Bill Watkinson, who was a pilot. He was he flew with Billy on some of the missions. Uh, he just passed away about six months ago, uh, but he at least could tell them what he remembered. He told me a lot of his material as well. I mentioned earlier the Laffey, the, the ship that fended off all those kamikazes. That's right here, and that is at the Yorktown at Patriots Point. There's the Laffey, that's also a floating museum there. Now in 1968, in one of the poems that Hattie wrote, she ended with nothing but memories as we journey on, longing for a smile from a loved one gone. None know the depths of our deep regret, but we remember when others forget. Now just a tiny lesson to end the presentation here. Those words that Hattie wrote were powerful, I thought. We remember when others forget. How can we make sure Billy and Eugene and Sayla and Harrison and every other veteran uh, aren't forgotten? Well, we can take a lesson from those veterans. Billy cannot talk to us. Eugene cannot talk to us about this. So I'll leave it up to Stan Bowen. <clears throat> Stan was a, a corpsman. Navy corpsman, working with the Marines who landed on Tarawa and later on Iwo Jima, etc. Tarawa was a brutal three-day battle on an island, small, maybe you know Grosiel down the river, yeah. a small island in the Detroit uh, River. Tarawa was smaller than that, two miles long, 800 yards wide at the widest. Nowhere to hide, no back lines, constant combat. Think of the opening scene, combat scene in Saving Private Ryan, and stretched out for three days. That's sort of what Taro was like. Stan Bowen went on that island without a weapon, because he was a corpsman to, to patch people up, right? <clears throat> Here's Stan at that time, and Stan in California uh, in his 80s. At one time in the battle, this is an AM track. Amphibious tractor. It has treads. It can go in the water, and then when it hits land, it continue on land. Well, there was a damaged Amtrak in the lagoon, and four wounded Marines behind it. Couldn't get away because Japanese fire pinned them down. Stan was on shore. He ran into the lagoon, grabbed two of the wounded Marines, turned around and ran back to shore with them, all under fire. Laid them in the sand. Went back out, got the other two, and did the same. 
Amazing. Then when he's on the beach, there are wounded men all over the place. And he said, John, it was a you know, hell hole. He said, everywhere I looked, there were bodies. And I was trying to help as many as I could. And he said, I came upon this one young Marine, couldn't have been more than 18. And I looked at him and I thought, there's no chance. He's too gravely wounded. And I looked down at the young boy, and he looked up at me, and he said, don't go. I don't want to die at all. So the kid knew he was dying. He stands to John. What do I do? There was a Marine over here five yards away I could save if I could get to him, and another eight yards over there that I could save if I could get to him. And he's asking me. I had to go on the little guy alone. Now Stan was mid-80s when he told me that, crying like a woman, as I'm tearing up right now. I always do when I tell this part of him. And he said, crying like a woman. But he had to let him go on the guy alone. So I asked Stan a question. I asked every veteran. And I've learned to know exactly what the response will be. Are you a hero, Stan? No, I'm no hero. I did what anybody else would do. That was my job. The guy's hurt. You've got to go get him. Then he says the words that every veteran says, whether it's World War II, Vietnam, today, any male, female would say the same thing as what Stan then said. I was supposed to do John, I was supposed to do that, and I did it. That's all. And he shrugged his shoulders. Like, mm, no big deal. That really got me thinking. That's a pretty darn big deal. I just did a lot of sport. Look at how many people do what they're supposed to do and how many don't. Right? I'll use education. You know, if we, what if we all did what we were supposed to do? Using education since I was in that. What if every teacher taught just the way he or she was supposed to? You and I both had some wonderful teachers, at least I hope you did. And we also had some who should never have been in a classroom. Never. What if every administrator administered just the way he or she was supposed to? What if every student studied just the way they're supposed to? Nothing more, nothing less. And what if every parent parent just the way they're supposed to? Man, wouldn't it be something? It's sort of like the, the message of the Eleanor Roosevelt had a prayer. In World War II, she visited servicemen and women quite often. Her sons were in active combat. One was a, what would be called Special Forces today, Jimmy Roosevelt. And so it meant a lot to her. She had a prayer <clears throat> that she kept in her purse, she said it every day, and it went, Dear Lord, lest I continue my complacent way, help me to remember somewhere out there a man died for me today. As long as there be war, I then must ask and answer. Did I do what I'm supposed to do, like stand up? Probably for same message as the main scene of Saving Private Ryan. You know at the end when Private Ryan played by Matt Damon, um, they found him. Captain Miller played by Tom Hanks is dying, propped up at the wall there. <coughs> and Tom Hanks' character, Captain Miller, Calls Private Ryan come over, which he does. Captain Miller lifts himself up as much as he can, and he says as loud as he can, but probably was more of a whisper, earn this. Earn it. In other words, we have just died to save you, Private Ryan. Go home and earn this. Gift. Be a good man. Be a good person. Do what you're supposed to do. That's why my favorite scene in the movie is right after that when the elderly Private Ryan is back in the Normandy Cemetery. 
His whole family, including grandkids, are right behind a bit. And he walks up to Captain Miller's, looks down at the words. And he says, I tried to remember what you told me that day on the bridge. And his wife comes over, uh, Private Ryan's wife, comes walking over. And he turns, he looked at her, and with, I mean, almost like you could feel the emotion and the longing coming out of his eyes. He says, Well, if we, we can earn this gift and make sure all those veterans are not forgotten, simply by doing that, do what we're supposed to do. It will be a better world, and this little boy in Arlington National Cemetery will have a wonderful future. Now, that picture was taken about 16 years ago, to my grandson, <laughs> and there he is today at the Air Force Academy. He's known as fourth year, his last year at the Air Force Academy. <clears throat> He'll be part of the space program. Uh, they've already begun in there. The seniors just received their postings for their first part of their career. They'll be part of the space program. So he'll have a good life too. Now the last three words I always give to some very close friends I had in Akron, Ohio, when I was just a tiny little thing in grade school. So they'll get the final part here. But anyway, here they come. That's all. <laughs> so that's the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, there's also, as I say, books here if you're interested in looking at them, purchasing them, whatever. There's something here you, that I don't have, or something you want that I don't have here, I have it at home. Yes, sir. Do you have email? We can send you some comments. I'm sorry? Do you have email? Oh, yes. It's I have business cards Okay. with my ad, address, email address on, and bookmarks here also with email address on. So feel free to take whatever you want. Okay. Um, and, and then email me with anything, comments or requests or whatever, critique. Yes, ma'am. You had mentioned that the World War II documents are declassified and that you can find them online. Uh, for World War II? Just where, do we, where do we go look for Okay, that? here's where the archives um, hired a company to digitize all the World War II records. And they're almost complete now. Uh, the ones that I need for my stuff, they are complete. It's called, the website is called Fold, F-O-L-D, Three, the number three, fold3.com. Okay, that's simple. Yeah, it's that simple. You go online, and it, I use it all the time, and so it costs me a hundred bucks a year or so. Um, if you want, you know, there I think they have a certain number that are free, and then you pay a little bit for something. But even the hundred bucks, you can get all these records. Um, you can type in the name of a serviceman, type in the name of a ship, type in the name of a First Marine Division.